If you are worried you have Lyme disease, or just like the outdoors, and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Hey everybody, this is Robert. And welcome again to Outbreak News Interviews. You know, in an earlier episode of the podcast, we discussed the giant intestinal roundworm, Ascaris lumbricoides. It's a nematode parasite. Today we're going to look at the most common nematode infection in the, in the United States. The pinworm, also known as the threadworm, Enterobius vermicularis. Joining me to shed some light on this common parasite is friend to the show, Rosemary Drizdell. Rosemary is a parasitology teacher and author of the book, Parasites, Tales of Humanity's Most Unwelcome Guest. Hello, Rosemary, and thanks for spending this time with me once again. Hi, Robert. Thanks for asking me. Now, what is a pinworm? And uh, can you describe the adult parasite morphology? Sure. A pinworm is a tiny worm, actually. You mentioned the the giant intestinal worm, Ascaris lumbricoides. Pinworm is at the other end of the scale. It's about the size of an eyelash, only fatter, so very small, and that's the female. The male is even smaller than that and actually very difficult, just barely visible to see with the naked eye. It's called pinworm because the shape of the female at the tail end, she narrows to a very sharp looking little point. So she looks a bit like a pin. She is basically a tube of eggs. A female pinworm can contain between 10,000 and 11,000 eggs. And often if you look at her under a stereo microscope, you can't see any internal structure at all because she's just so full of these eggs. Now, we call it pinworm down here in the States. Uh, I hear the term threadworm used for it also. Is threadworm a Canadian or is it a UK um, name for the enterobius? I'm not sure, but like you, I typically hear the worm called pinworm. I think threadworm is confusing because it's sometimes confused with another worm, Trichurus trichiura. So uh, nowadays I think people tend to stick with pinworm. Now, this is a pretty common parasitic infection, isn't it? It is a very common worm. Depending on who you listen to, it might be the most common intestinal nematode that infects people. Other people would say that Ascaris has that distinction, but I think it could very well be pinworm because it's present in all populations everywhere all over the globe. It has the advantage of being transmissible directly from person to person without having to spend any period of time in the environment, which means that it can pass from person to person in the Arctic, in the tropics, or anywhere in between. Now, what are the risk factors for pinworm, and how is it contracted? Anyone can catch it, although we do see it most commonly in children. Also, in people who live closely together, say institutionalized people, or uh, also people with poor hygiene. And it really does boil down to poor hygiene and the ability of the worm to be transmitted directly from person to person. So unwashed hands, and and of course we see that more commonly in children than in most other groups. You catch it by swallowing or inhaling the eggs that I mentioned. These eggs tend to be, they, they can be airborne, but they also tend to be rather sticky and so they can adhere to surfaces such as taps and doorknobs and anything around the house really, clothing, bedding, towels, that kind of thing. So a, an environment can be quite heavily contaminated with pinworm eggs. I found one study where they looked at a school 
and they looked at pinworm eggs that were sort of stuck to the wall. In the hallway of the school, they found about 119 eggs in a square foot of hallway wall. In the classroom, 305. And astonishingly, in the washroom, 5,000 pinworm eggs in a square foot of wall. Mm -hmm. So that gives you an idea of just how heavily a building can be contaminated with pinworm eggs. And one other number for you. 7.7 .7 to 13.1 eggs per gram of dust. And so these are the ones that become airborne and then settle out with dust in the air. So they really could be anywhere and in quite surprisingly large numbers. Mm -hmm. um, now, what about the life cycle? Is there anything unique about the life cycle of the pinworm? The pinworm has an interesting life cycle. The adults tend to live in the cecum, which is the very first part of the large intestine, or in you know the area around that in the large intestine or small intestine. And when the female is ready to deposit her eggs, she crawls out through the entire length of the large intestine, out through the anal opening onto the perianal skin, and there she basically explodes. So you get the all of those eggs being deposited there in that perianal area and like I said they're sticky and they also cause some itching so people tend to scratch especially children again they tend to scratch and they get the eggs on their hands and underneath their fingernails and so after that anything they touch can become contaminated with pinworm eggs those eggs are infective to another person almost immediately so anybody that comes along and touches anything that the infected person has touched or perhaps makes the bed and maybe flips the sheets around a little bit and it makes the eggs become airborne, then they're likely to become infected with the pinworm as well. So uh, if somebody in a family has pinworm, it's very likely that everybody is infected. Now you mentioned itching. Uh, are there other symptoms that go along with pinworm? Itching is definitely the most common and the most infamous symptom. But we also see restlessness, particularly at night, because it's when you're asleep that the female worms tend to crawl out and explode and leave all those eggs. So sleeplessness, irritability, perhaps just from discomfort or from lack of sleep. It can be painful or kind of a tickly sensation. And of course, if you scratch a lot, you can damage the skin so that you sometimes get secondary bacterial skin infections. Abdominal pain has also been reported. And then we have the instances of worms that kind of go wandering. So they can get into the peritoneal cavity. They can wander outside and into the female genital system, sometimes around the urethra, so they can end up in all kinds of interesting places. The appendix is another place where we tend to see pinworms, and there has been a reported association between pinworm and appendicitis over the years, although it's not really clear whether the pinworm has anything to do with the appendicitis or whether it's just an incidental finding. probably doesn't cause acute appendicitis, but may cause some inflammation in that area. And I should mention that many pinworm infections are asymptomatic. So you always have to be aware of that asymptomatic person who doesn't even know that they have the infection, but could still be harboring it and spreading it to others. So how is the pinworm diagnosed? It's, it's a little bit different than diagnosis of other, uh, other parasites, right? It is. For most intestinal worms, we look for eggs in the stool or sometimes the worms themselves or segments of them. But for the pinworm, because of that life cycle where the female pinworm crawls outside and deposits the eggs outside, that's the best place to look for them. We do find them in stool samples at times, but the age-old specimen for diagnosing pinworm is simply a piece of scotch tape so you lay it over the perianal skin and then stick it to a slide, and we can look at the slide under the microscope. Nowadays, people in the laboratory aren't as keen on that kind of specimen because you can imagine when you're dealing with all those eggs, it's very hard not to externally contaminate that slide. So you could then end up with a laboratory-acquired case of pinworm infection. So it's, it's not our favorite. We like something like a, a Vaseline swab where you can get a little bit more distance from the eggs while you're collecting the specimen. But that is the key to get the specimen from that area and to identify the eggs and sometimes the adult worms as well. Now, the treatment, um, 
it's pretty easy to treat, right, Rosemary? Yes and no. The worm is susceptible to common uh, antiparasitic drugs that we use, such as mebendazole, albendazole, and parental pomalate. However, you've probably got the sense that it's not just the patient we need to worry about, but also the environment. So it can be quite difficult to eradicate enterobius in a family or in a building. You have to try to clean up as much as possible, regular laundry, good hygiene, and often it's recommended that people are treated a second time, about two weeks after the first. This is because those eggs will remain viable for two to three weeks. So if you can clean up the area and then those eggs will start to die naturally and you treat the patient again, then you're more likely to be able to achieve uh, a real proper cleanup of the worm. Yeah, so there's, you mentioned there's issues of contaminating family members and uh, just now you alluded to uh, issues of reinfection with pinworms. That's right. Yeah. It's very common to become reinfected because those eggs remain in the environment. And I have a quote for you from a paper. Cleaning a bathroom using a damp cloth with an antibacterial agent or bleach merely spreads viable eggs. So they're really not very sensitive to the antiseptic cleaners that we use, and they're very persistent in the environment of a home. Hmm. Um, all right, Rosemary, you got any interesting stories to tell us about pinworm? One thing that I find fascinating about pinworm is that there's long been a theory that it may carry a protozoan parasite called Diontamoeba fragilis mm -hmm. within the actual eggs of the of the worm. And the reason that this is has been has been proposed is because it's known in some other species and it's not clear how the protozoan would get from person to person otherwise because it doesn't have a resistant environmental stage. So there hasn't really been proof of this, although there's been a suspicion for decades. Yes. And, and recently, researchers found that they could isolate the DNA of the protozoan from eggs that had been externally sterilized and cleaned, which is good, strong evidence that those worm eggs do harbor that protozoan and that it can be passed from person to person in that way. What I find really interesting to think about is it suggests that possibly the protozoan is a parasite of enterobius and was a parasite of enterobius before it became a parasite of humans. So perhaps we're an intermediate host or an accidental host of a protozoan that, that's actually a parasite of a parasite. Even parasites have their problems. Interesting theory. Yes. All right. Well, thanks again, Rosemary, for your time and expertise. I really appreciate it. My pleasure.